Today's topic is how you can combine data warehouse automation with automated testing. We have two parts to it. I will present the data vault part. Thomas will present the big eval part, but I hand over the word to him to introduce himself in the beginning. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to be here and uh, to have you here. Uh, thank you for your interest. Um, my name is Thomas Bolt. I'm the CTO and founder of Biggiewell. Um, I came from uh, the area of data warehouse uh, implementation be uh, uh, before I founded our company. So um, I know what's about uh, building a data warehouse and uh, I know what's about uh, data quality and test automation uh, regarding um, uh, such uh, data centric projects. And I will show you today um, how this works together with uh, our partner, uh, Data World Builder, uh, Peter. And I hand over to you for your um, introduction. Thank you. So my name is Peter Belles, and I'm very happy that Thomas is here because we've met again and again at different occasions, different uh, uh, exhibitions and stuff like that. And he's very long in the business. He's really deep into this automated testing topic. So I'm very happy that he's with me here. He is here with me. My name is Peter Belles. I will present you the Data Vault Builder part. My background is as well in data warehousing. I started somewhere around the year 2000. I already was able to implement stuff with classical Inman modeling, with Kimball modeling. And at the end, I ended up with Data Vault modeling. I will show you that we are using this in the core. And together, we will show you a little bit how the process can work, how you can automate development, how you can automate testing that you have fully fledged process covering a lot of stuff in your corporation. We are both Swiss-based companies. We are located here in Zurich. Thomas is not too far away, but I think you're outside of the city, uh, in front of the city. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, we are right at the airport of Zurich uh, in Kloten. Uh, so that's our uh, main headquarters there, uh, but we also have uh, a location uh, in Chicago, the United States, uh, since last year. Uh, so we'll be happy to speak with you also in the United States if you're located there. Well, for us, we have uh, we are Swiss based, but we have clients in the US, in Australia, uh, throughout Europe. We have a lot, as well many local partners. So if you want to have local contacts, that's possible for both of our companies. And what is the problem we are addressing? Today, usually our clients don't have the issue that there is not enough data, but that they have a lot of different data sources. The data sources are changing and they need to bring the data together updated regularly. Thing, oh, my microphone somehow blocked. So today there is already a lot of data in many companies. And the problem is that you have a lot of different data sources. You have external data, you have internal data, the data sources are changing and you need to bring all of this in an integrated way together and bring it to your data consumers. And you need to update it regularly. You need to document where the data is coming from. And that's a very big challenge. And this challenge is not new. We had this since I started in the industry, but it looked a little bit more like this when I started. We had nine different tools working together, many different interfaces. I believe many of you know this kind of scenarios. It's very difficult to start a project, but it's possible. But the longer it's running, the more difficult it is to bring new people on the project. They need to learn a lot of components. Then you need to update parts of it and everything becomes complicated. And slowly the change speed is decreasing until it stops. And this was the start point where we said, we need to bring everything into one solution. So we replace all the different tools from data modeling, data warehouse, code generation, operations, infrastructure automation, deployment. And we have as well REST APIs for testing, but we have as well the possibility to do X metadata for uh, automated regression testing. And we will see that a little bit later how this can interact with standardized testing tools. 
And the target for all of this is to deliver at the same time better analytical data quality, but as well lower the cost and risk and shorten the time to insight. So that means how long does it take if you have a new requirement until you can deliver it to your data consumers. So how do we achieve that? The main idea is that we start with a model-driven approach. And this is a business model. So we are not talking about source system, tables, or any technical object. The idea is to talk about core business concepts. What is your business about? Which things are involved? Which people are involved? What are the processes they do? What are places involved? And we add this to the data model. And this becomes the glue between the IT department and the business people. And why this be, uh, does this become the glue? Because the business users can now bring in their knowledge into this design decision. And they get back later on the data from this data model so they understand it. And they feel involved. And they as well get all the metadata that was generated here into their reports. And that's why they understand why participating in this design process helps. And the IT profits from the business knowledge and as well by automation that this business model is then generated helps them to uh, pre prevent doing them boring tasks, just creating tables, creating load statements. That is everything already derived from the data model. So data models were used in the past. Why didn't that work out so well? when you have seen this maybe in other cases, because before we had this data models created in separate tools, we printed them out literally, or we created PDFs, handed them over to the developers, and they went and started developing. And when they were developing, they figured out usually that the data doesn't match the expectations from the business, that maybe in the technical system, something was solved differently than you would expect it business-wise. And so they changed the implementation. And maybe sometimes never communicated back to the business that it was implemented differently and all the problems started. So the different approach here is that we have the model and in real time, it's converted into working code. This means that while you're in a modeling session, you can test out and get feedback and present it to the business users. What changed, what are the different variants, what would be the effect if you implement something, something differently. And it doesn't stop there. It covers the full process. So it starts with infrastructure automation, it covers as well deployment, code versioning, documentation, data lineage, deployment, and as well operations. Because data warehouse project is not just creating once a solution. It is really something that goes on, that changes over time, and that you need to operate for years to come. If you want to see how we compare to other vendors, you can download the report from our web page. And I'm happy that our users reported that they are very satisfied with the product. They gave us the best recommendation rate in the category. And what I'm very proud of especially is the time to market category because that's why the Data Vault Builder was created to shorten the times from your requirements to deliver value to your data consumers. Maybe a little bit that you get the idea which kind of clients are using that. We have clients like eGym that are producing this kind of gym machines. They're collecting all the information from this machine integrated with different other sources. And they have a data team of two people. And these two people not just only create the data integration part, but as well the reporting and everything and testing and just everything. At the, on the other end of the scale, we have customers like Prosim and Zadines that have 40 different developers integrating two different data warehouses into one on Snowflake and do distributed development, do CICD, and especially in this kind of use cases, you can't progress without any regression testing. And that's what we will see what this can conclude. You can automate testing on different elements that you can parse through whole object categories and apply the same tests to them that you don't need to write every single test manually. So what are the layers that we are covering in the Data Vault Builder? For sure, we cover the core modeling part, which is conceptual and logical data modeling. We generate the implementation in the core, the physical implementation. It's two way. If you change the implementation, it changes as well the code. And we have a staging area. And in the staging area, you can connect to many different sources like SAP data. You can connect to JDBC sources, Python scripts, NoSQL information. 
And that's the second step. After you have created that, you can connect the staging layer with the core just by defining the business key. Everything else is generated. So in fact, you need to just define what are your requirements and the technical implementation like tables, views, load statements, ETL flows are generated automatically. And if you load your raw world, you want to access the data and you never should give anybody access directly. So we have as well here the interface layer. So by selecting the grain and the level of denormalization, you can create your dimensional models, third normal form, flat tables and data products if you're more into data mesh. So this is all possible because here we are more normalized than in the output. And the good thing is now here in every level that we do, we generate metadata, which is freely available through the database and through REST APIs. And that's then the link to data catalogs, but as well to testing tools like Big Eval that can read this kind of metadata and start their testing processes on top of it. We are mainly an ETL tool, a ELT tool. For staging, we can use ETL, but as well, if the data is already pre-staged or the database offers staging capabilities, we can use them as well. So here is exactly the interface to big eval. And what can they test? They can test the core uniqueness of, of hash keys, business keys. They can test as well the result of virtual rules. If you put in your expectations, what should be the output? They can test as well if the staging was successful, if any data type formats are there. So they can really access all of the layers. We deliver all the metadata and you can automate your tests there. Which kind of model uh, modules is implemented in the Data Vault Builder is we start with infrastructure setup. We deliver the software as Docker containers so you can run it on premises in the cloud. You really choose freely where, where to run it. We have the model to code conversion, but the difference to other tools is we have visual modeling and we deliver the patterns with the tool that you need to generate your code. It's two-way. If you change the code, the model is updated. You have a data profiling tool in it to do ad hoc checks of the data. In parallel, we create documentation and lineage always in real time while you're modeling. So your documentation is always up to date and your tests, which can be here executed, can be kept automatically up to date as well. We have as well deployment built in. We have two different ways of deploying. One is a simplified deployment. So you can compare just two environments. It writes to the deployment script or you have a Git flow based approach. And if you get tired of this, there are REST APIs to automate that as well. Operation is built in. So it's creating your master jobs, the load order, and as well, it has a built in scheduler. You can use it or not. Again, we have as a REST APIs for everything. So you can use external tools as well. High availability might be a topic for you and that all is covered in the data vault. Build. Here at this layer through the metadata views and through the REST APIs, you can use your preferred testing tool to run your tests. So what is the difference to other automation tools? And the approach is usually if you use data warehouse automation, you have a modeling tool, you have a repository, and implementation. The problem with the repository is it creates delays. And while you already model here something, it's disconnected from the implementation. So at least temporary, there are differences. But as well, in the long run, it happens again and again that the implementation is changed by developers and it disconnects your physical implementation in the database from what is in your model. And if this happens, the problem starts. More and more people distrust the model and it falls everything apart. So that's why in the data vault builder, if you model something in real time, it's implemented directly in your database. Don't worry, we are not doing this on your production database. The tool has fully ITIL compliant deployment process. So you just do it in your development environment if you're in a smaller team, or you do it in a sandbox if you have bigger teams and distribute the development. And it is not only one way, it is as well two ways. So if you change something in the code, your model gets updated as well. And this ensures that you know that your documentation is in sync with your implementation. And it ensures that if you test something that you test on the right metadata and not on something that should be there, that you maybe miss some hubs or satellites or link tables because the metadata is always up to date. And just to get the idea. So if I create here a concept of a flight, in the model, in the same second, the database table 
that will hold the data will be created. All the metadata is well put on the objects in the database. If I would change the metadata here, the model changes as well. So everything is in sync. So instead of going through the design process until you generate your stuff and test your stuff, and this might take maybe days if you do it manually or hours if you are partially automated, we go down to seconds. So we always know that the implementation and the model are always in sync. We can test right away with data. And this means that after every step, we can as well start regression testing. We don't need to generate stuff. In the moment, we have modeled it. We believe everything is fine. We can trigger off the regression test and you can automate that as well that you put this like in your Git process, in your Git flow process that at certain steps, a whole new environment is built up that your test data is loaded and then some testing tool is triggered. And second thing is what we see here is that we believe that your physical implementation of your data warehouse changes over time as database technology evolves, data modeling evolves. And if you create your manual implementation, you need to take care of the updates yourself. And this is different if you're model driven, so we can generate again and again, newer versions of your physical data model. And we are doing this based on your logical and conceptual data model. And we don't just deliver you the new patterns, but we deliver you as well the update scripts for existing physical implementation. So you can keep your data and everything for years and you don't need to put in the maintenance work. And this ensures that your investment that you do today will be still worth something in five and 10 years. And why is that possible? Because we are based on standards. It usually doesn't matter where hot and cold water is as long as it's always the same. And that's why there is a standard. And that's the same with the data vault builder. In the core, we use for the storage data vault approach. It doesn't mean that for the output, you need to output data vault. No, you will output dimensional models, third normal form, or flat tables, or data products. You're completely free there. It's just about the storage, the maintenance of the data, and the deployment. And we have very strict technical naming. So all our 150 installations worldwide have exactly the same technical naming standard. So you don't need to care about that. It's documented. And if in five years down the road, we need to send you update scripts, we will find all the necessary object in your database and can apply the necessary updates. And you're completely free to model whatever business names, rules, and whatever you have, because your business is different than all the other businesses. So no limitations there. Why should you take such approach? And this is as well for automated testing. It saves you a lot of time, but and many people forget that it reduces risk. Every time you create your own approach, it might fail because you're doing it the first time, maybe the second or third time if you did it in other companies, but you don't have the security that many other companies are using exactly the same standardized approach. And as well, this lowers your maintenance cost because the standardized tool already do a lot of the work for you. So let's have a look. And it will be five minutes that I give enough time to Thomas as well that he can demo and then we can talk about questions at the end. So let's have a short switch over to the Data Vault Builder. And what we see here is that I have started up a new instance of the Data Vault Builder and I have already loaded from my Git repository data model. The data model itself was created in the Data Vault Builder. So we have here different core business concepts. Here are the blue boxes. We are, have grouped that into topic areas. We have in here relations and without knowing anything about data vault, you already recognize this. That's the same, the same like an ontology. So you have here concept, you have relations, you have attributes. It's always like the same stuff. So we have more here like a logical data model expressing what you want to achieve about your business. And that's very simple to communicate with your business users. They will understand their business terms in here and they can give their input. They can put in all the descriptions and all the metadata stored directly in the database. So this is step one. Yes, you can browse here through the data model and see what is everything connected to it, but as well, the possibility is there that you can create bookmarks and you recall the same views again and again, because we have in the meantime, customers with several hundred of core business concepts in here. The next step is that we change now more into a data-driven perspective. So let's connect a new source system and let's say that we want to just demo some flight information. And I, as you see, we have many different source systems already here. And I take here now the CSV file system. 
I define where the data is coming from. I can test if the folder exists. And now I can select from this source system which kind of tables I want to stage. And I will skip a lot of functionality here. We don't have too much time, but there is a lot of stuff in here that you can use later, like changing data types, changing names. You can put your own queries to the source system if they can't provide views and stuff like that. You can do delta loading, you can do CDC loading, but to explain all of this would be a little bit too much and we don't have that much time. What I wanna concentrate on is that here, we see the advantage again of direct implementation. So the target table will be created the ETL load in that case, because it's external data will be created, the load will be started, operations will be updated, documentation will be updated, all the metadata information in the database will be right away updated. This means a few seconds later, the data is loaded and we can have a look in the stage table, but it has quite a lot of columns. So let's go into the data profiling tool and let's look into this more structured, to, let's take maybe the carrier, let's do a tree map. And already, if we are working in, even with the business user, we can give him maybe some feedback if these codes are okay, if these airlines are the ones he's expecting or if there are any issues. And now step three is to connect the source data with the target. And this is then the step then Thomas will take over and they will test, they will test if our loads completed successfully. On most databases, we are using like primary and foreign keys. So the chance of problems is very low, even not impossible. We could do an error in the version potentially, but like on systems like Snowflake, you can create primary keys, but they're not enforced. So it can make sense on certain databases as well to check basic stuff. If nothing happened, if there was maybe a concurrent load manually, somebody interacting with the data that could have created a problem. And to define the load from the staging area into a hub, I add here my source table and I will need to define what the business key is. So I would take like the flight number and the date. I can do here compound keys and it tells me, and this is the advantage working directly off the data. This is what I mean that we get feedback within seconds. It tells me already with the stage data that we have an issue that the unique carrier code is not unique. So let's add this one as well. And that's the second iteration and even this one fails. And this is like a real scenario that we see often already in POCs that customer numbers are not unique, product numbers are not unique. And nobody noticed that because nobody's testing that because it's not that simple just with a click. Yes, you could do it, but many people don't do it every time because they believe like, why should be there ever duplicating the customer number? And if this is given, now I skip a lot of settings again, I can now generate all the necessary loads. I can create so-called satellite where the context or attributes about these concepts are stored. All the necessary loads are created, tracking objects are created. And this is like example that many people forget when they first time try to manually do it, they forget to add the tracking objects, then they don't realize if something was deleted in the source system and nobody informed them about. And here, everything is automated. So. By creating the load, it changed as well the staging ETL flow. It added like the technical business key and hash key calculation. It updated the data and loaded it. And this means that a few seconds later already, we can here access this object and see what the result is. The same is valid for, for the satellite. So we can just start the load. And it will not only do a STD type two load, it will calculate which records changed. It will only insert records that changed since the last load or since the last uh, values we received, if they are different, but it creates as well STD type one materialization for as of now views and a lot of stuff that you would realize over time that you need to implement yourself. So let's have a look on if the data is loaded, it's already ready. And this all is already production ready. The only thing what we need is to create an interface. And that's the last thing that I will show before I just highlight what was created in the background. So we select the grain, we select the source system, and we select here if we want to output only as of now information, which is STD type one or as of then, including load time and load time end calculation. So we'll create automatic pit tables and everything. So let's select just the one. 
And now we can virtually create just our interface, drag in the columns. We don't need to reload any information as well as I created the interface already before. I can as well match it based on the names, I automatically assign them. And let's preview the data. In the background, data lineage was created. So we could filter for that. And this is available at the database and REST API level. Operations was created. So we have as well here already a ready job that can be started, that can be scheduled. And we have documentation. And this documentation is really just a view of the metadata that is in the database. So it's reading now from the database. You know exactly that this exists in the database. If I would go there and delete some objects on the database, it would be removed from the documentation. So we could go on, could go on and here simulate the deployment. This is now the simplified deployment. It shows us the differences between environments and we're good to go. And this was really the minimal walkthrough the data vault builder, I've missed the business rules, I missed multi-tenancy, I missed CDC loading, by time probably it's a lot of stuff that is in there. So if you're interested in any special topic, feel free to book a demo and we can go into more details with your challenges. And I will now hand over with this, what we have created to Thomas to present us the big eval part. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Peter. Um... I'd like to continue with a very impressive number, but uh, let me share my screen first. Um, okay, just a second. Okay, here we are. Okay, um, so this uh, impressive number uh, is about how many uh, records within your source systems, within your ERP, CRMs, and so on, uh, are um, contain at least one critical error. An error means uh, it could have an impact into, onto your business, but uh, it doesn't need to. So, but um, at one day it could have, uh, um, if that happens, uh, there are uh, huge um, uh, financial impacts onto your business. And um, so these are numbers uh, we have from different sources, from Gartner and Harvard Business Review. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, really impressive. So that's uh, one good reason why you should have a good uh, data quality. And But uh, you may think, uh, why do I need um, any kind of data quality or test automation solution if I have a data warehouse automation solution that automates um, uh, most of my tasks or a lot of the tasks I do uh, in uh, building a data warehouse? So, um, yeah, uh, it's simple. Um, a kind of uh, these manufacturing plants here uh, that have uh, heavy uh, automation solutions like these robotic arms and so on. Uh, also, these have uh, quality assurance uh, uh, tasks at the end of the production or in between. So, and uh, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, the, the the output of such uh, high automated uh, products is uh, error free, uh, because there could, uh, are different reasons uh, why. Uh, products can be of bad quality that flow into. So your data may have a bad uh, data quality uh, that you are loading into your data vault or your data uh, warehouse uh, at the end. And um, I will show you a lot more reasons uh, on another slide later on. And so let's have a look at uh, this uh, formula. Uh, it says uh, that if you want to have the best results uh, out uh, of your data in form of uh, reports, data analytics, or maybe as an input for your uh, business processes or technical processes, you need, you need uh, uh, two things. First of all, you need a high, uh, high quality of data. And secondly, you need uh, error-free working uh, technical systems that transform your data, that loads your data, or whatever uh, else it does. Uh, if just one of these uh, components uh, are of bad quality, uh, the output uh, may be garbage, uh, or in other words, it could harm your business at the end. So we are talking about two disciplines that are covered by BigEWell. Uh, the first one is uh, data quality management. So that's about ensuring the quality of your data uh, during the whole life cycle of information. So uh, starting at when, it, when you cre create data, uh, uh, during uh, transformation, loading, analytics, and so on, until data gets archived at the end. 
And the second discipline is data test automation. And that's what we are going to uh, talk about today. And uh, data test automation means it ensures the quality of uh, your, um, uh, your uh, uh, technical components you are building in a development project or uh, during the release cycle of these uh, components uh, or systems. And uh, as I said, uh, BigEWell uh, covers both of these topics. Uh, you start usually with data test automation and uh, use that during the release cycle of your products. Uh, but you can also use the same uh, uh, test cases or data validation cases also in data quality management. This gives you a very good foundation uh, to start data quality management. Um, as an example, if you check whether all customers uh, have been loaded into a data vault, uh, you can do that uh, on a daily basis to check uh, whether uh, your integration processes works on a daily basis. So that's the same in test automation and also in data quality management. So it makes sense there. Okay, so, uh, but... Uh, why do such uh, problems happen? Uh, here we have a very simple um, and uh, generic uh, approach of a data analytics solution. Uh, so uh, it starts with data sources, uh, with integration pipelines, your data vault, and so on, until you present data to people in very different formats or could be also uh, uh, using data in uh, processes or whatever. And here we have our data warehouse automation solution that usually covers a lot of these tasks uh, that need to be done during development. Uh, so maybe architecture modeling, uh, also uh, processes uh, like the load process or let's say a transformation process or something like this. And also the logic that is used to do this. Uh, all this uh, stuff is uh, automated and standardized and uh, uh, works very well, efficiently and quickly. So that uh, makes sense to trust to this uh, to, to lay trust into these components. Uh, but there are uh, other um, uh, uh, factors that may influence what comes out uh, and gets presented to people. So first of all, um, here your data sources are in a perspective of a data warehouse developer out of control. So there may be uncertain behavior or error prone data uh, that comes uh, from your data sources. I have uh, two examples here. Uh, maybe uh, there are manual inputs into your ERP system. Um, you know, uh, people are very creative uh, when they are um, uh, entering data, they may use uh, an, a note field or a text field to enter some data there. They may use uh, another field to enter wrong data or, or something that's not allowed there and what you not expect from a perspect perspective of a data warehouse uh, implementer. Uh, on the other side, um, another example could be uh, in data integration, if you have multiple sources, like uh, here, as an, an example from a grocery store, they have uh, a lot of uh, subsidiaries here, and uh, they um, deliver data to the uh, data integration flow on a daily basis. Uh, sometimes it happens that uh, one uh, store doesn't deliver the, uh, data at, uh, at one day, and this needs uh, to be um, catched uh, to uh, uh, to ensure that um, uh, you uh, don't get wrong data at the end uh, into presentation in the presentation layer. Okay, and uh, on the presentation end, uh, often um, um, people are using uh, manual solutions. They they are building uh, reports, dashboards, and so on. Uh, not using automation solution, and there is also a source for errors. And so it makes sense to uh, to uh, do test automation through the whole um, cycle here, or through all layers of your architecture here. Uh, we call this end-to-end -end testing. Uh, I forgot one uh, part here. Uh, there may be also custom logic in your data warehouse automation solution. Maybe you build a transformation there uh, that is error, um, error prone, uh, probably, and uh, this could also lead to errors at the end. So, uh, because of these parts here, uh, it makes sense to use test automation, despite of having a, an automated data warehouse generator or building solution. 
So where uh, can we use Piggy well? So let's look at this um, um, logical architecture here. Uh, we have a development environment here on, on the bottom, a QA or test environment in the middle, and on top we have our live or productive environment. Everywhere where we have um, an orange part uh, within this diagram, uh, this represents Biggiewell or Biggiewell's test cases. So first of all, we can do regression testing uh, on multiple layers here. We can do the same uh, in production here with data validation, as I mentioned before. Uh, but interesting regarding uh, your integration and deployment processes that may be automated uh, in an optimal uh, world. Uh, you can add quality gates. We call these quality gates because uh, it gates uh, your, uh, or it, it allows you to uh, gate uh, the flow of your uh, developed components or change components into uh, one of the upper uh, levels here. So if uh, something doesn't work here, uh, it, that means uh, your process may stop and doesn't uh, uh, integrate or deploy this uh, component into your life environment. So this is very helpful uh, to ensure that you only deploy things that work. Uh, so th th this also means you can embed uh, testing and data validation directly into your processes, in your, into your automated processes, uh, let's say in uh, Azure DevOps or Jenkins or any other uh, automation solution uh, in your CI CD processes. Um, but you can also integrate uh, uh, quality checks into your integration or data integration flows. So if you look here at the top uh, left um, here, you can see that we can also use data quality gates in, in our data integration flow. So this ensures that only data without errors uh, come into your live environment um, before uh, erroneous data um, impacts your business. You can even do data validation or in data sources like ERP systems or any other kind of uh, um, system here, uh, if you want. Okay. Um, Peter uh, already showed uh, a similar diagram uh, before. Uh, it looked a little bit different, but uh, it shows the same. Uh, we have here these agile sprints in an agile project environment. And uh, as he also showed there, um, uh, these phases uh, can be automated with uh, data warehouse automation solutions uh, like Data Vault Builder. And uh, there is still a gap uh, because uh, testing uh, is, uh, as we said, important and um, needs, to be, uh, uh, needs to be done as well within the short time of such a sprint. Uh, it makes sense to automate it. Uh, it, has, uh, um, it has a good reason why you should automate it. Uh, so with, with each sprint, uh, you usually add more test cases. That means you, uh, you repeat the same test cases from the previous sprint, uh, but you add more test cases. And uh, we, uh, it, this is called regression testing. So you repeat this, uh, these test cases from the previous sprints to ensure that everything works or still works uh, that you have done before in a previous sprint. Uh, this, uh, this amount uh, of test cases sum up. And uh, if you do this manually or you do manual tests here, uh, one day you don't have enough time to do this within the short time of such an agile sprint. And uh, yeah, so uh, you need to automate this if you decide to go with, uh, with uh, automation solutions in data warehouse. Um, uh, development. Uh, we have also an ROI cal calculator uh, that um, uh, uh, takes this in account and shows you how these numbers develop in your very specific uh, project. You can use this there. Uh, you can download an Excel sheet uh, that shows you a lot of details uh, regarding the efforts of testing manually and also automatically. Okay, uh, our customers are not using uh, Biggiewell also uh, just for quality assurance, as we talked about. Uh, they were very creative and uh, are using Biggiewell within many other um, scenarios here, even in more business-oriented scenarios uh, where uh, manual data-oriented tasks or, or data-oriented tasks have been done manually before. So let's say in uh, financial um, controlling, there are usually off or there are often 
written very large uh, Excel sheets uh, where people are doing manual uh, data comparison, reconciliation, or maybe uh, are validating this data. And a lot of these tasks can be automated with BigEWell, uh, so it also makes sense to look out for scenarios or usage cases uh, within uh, your business uh, departments. Uh, BigEWell is used by many different uh, customers uh, all over the globe uh, and um, from various uh, industries. We have clusters in financial and insurance uh, industries, but uh, it can be used by all other industries as well. So just uh, to give this overview to you. Um, okay, so but now how does it work? Um, uh, BiggieWell is a simple uh, approach, but uh, very important is connectivity for BiggieWell because BiggieWell is uh, technology agnostic. So that means uh, you connect your data sources um, from your whole architecture. Uh, that means uh, maybe your um, your ERP, your CRM systems, or uh, any other database, or also your data vault database or analytical databases. You connect these to BiggieWell, uh, and if it provides an ODB or an ODBC driver, uh, BiggieWell is able to connect to these technologies. So most uh, of today's uh, data um, databases provide one of these drivers, so BigEWell is able to connect to most technologies uh, that are current on the market. Then uh, we support flat files for sure. Uh, we also have native connectors to ERP and CRM systems like SAP or uh, Dynamics and many others. And we have connectors to uh, SaaS providers like Salesforce as an example. But also uh, if uh, we don't have a direct connector, you could use our REST API connector to connect to the APIs uh, these uh, uh, SaaS uh, solutions uh, usually provide. And uh, later on, we are going to talk about metadata. So I jump over that and we already talked about process integration. So you are building test cases and data validation cases within uh, BiggieWell. Uh, I will show you that later on. And if you have built them, automated uh, the execution of these uh, uh, test cases, uh, the test results flow into a dashboard. And there you can analyze the results and can look what happened, uh, where the issues come from and so on. And uh, we also have an alerting system, uh, so you can send notifications uh, via email or into a Teams channel or Slack channel or whatever. And then uh, we have third-party integration with uh, uh, Zapier, Power Automate from Microsoft's Power Platform and uh, many other systems. Uh, you can integrate uh, or you can uh, automatically build tickets in Jira or uh, many other solutions if you want. Uh, so BiggieWell doesn't stop when test results are ready. We can also trigger processes, technical processes, but also business processes uh, like um, fixing any data quality issues in your data sources, as an example. Uh, so this uh, makes um, BiggieWell very powerful during the daily uh, data quality management process. Uh, building a test case uh, within BiggieWell is, uh, is done in three different ways. First of all, we have a, a gallery or a kind of marketplace uh, that consists of hundreds of templates. And you can use these templates. Uh, most of them are free. Some of them are bundled into a package uh, belonging to a specific technology or practice. Uh, and uh, you can uh, also uh, buy license of these uh, bundles, but most are free. And uh, you can use them as a starting point to building your test cases. Then BiggieWell comes with uh, test algorithms built into the system. Uh, you can use them as well. And uh, if that's not enough, we have a very um, um, powerful um, and I would say advanced uh, scripting technology that allows you to build your own uh, test algorithms. And uh, I will show you that uh, regarding uh, the connectivity um, and, and um, collaboration with uh, uh, with Data Vault Builder uh, because uh, it uh, uses and um, this scripting technology is used to access uh, metadata from Data Vault Builder. 
And um, so if you uh, use one of these technology or, or techniques here to build your test cases, you are good to go within a couple of minutes uh, with Biggie Well. Uh, so install, you install it and within a couple of minutes, you have your first test cases. It's very simple to do and uh, it has um, uh, a very short time uh, to market uh, if you want so. So what can be done with Biggie Well? Um, we have a lot of different possibilities just to show you some of them here um, regarding uh, business intelligence testing. So um, I go to uh, uh, to the end-to-end -end testing here. That's uh, very interesting because uh, you can integrate uh, multiple data sources and multiple um, uh, testing points into the same test case. So you can do uh, as an example and test case that checks whether uh, the amount of um, uh, customers are the same in your ERP, in your cleansing area or staging area, maybe in your data vault, in analytics solutions and so on. So through the whole uh, architecture and uh, landscape of your data analytics solution. But we can also do security testing. So you may check whether your tabular model uh, works correctly or any other kind of model uh, because BigQL is able to, uh, to impersonate into different security contexts and test whether they are implemented correctly into your databases. And then we are also able to do performance testing as well. So uh, just to um, show you what's possible with BigQL. But let's come to uh, to the specific demo I will uh, show you um, and I give you a context uh, what you are going to see. Uh, so first of all, uh, BiggieWell is accessing uh, metadata from Data Vault Builder because everything you uh, you are modeling and uh, uh, designing within Data Vault Builder is stored within a repository database in the background, and BiggieWell is able to access this repository and this metadata from there, and this metadata can be used within a test case. Um, it's used to control the behavior of a test case. So that means uh, you have one simple single test case that may check whether you have any duplicates uh, in, uh, um, in a hub. Let, let's say it checks whether uh, you have duplicates with hash keys because as Peter already mentioned, uh, technologies like uh, Snowflake uh, um, do not check uh, for these uh, duplicates. And uh, it also uh, sometimes doesn't make sense to do these checks uh, with uh, other technologies as well, like SQL Server, for example, uh, if you want to load um, uh, data vaults uh, in parallel, uh, then you have specific uh, reasons or requirements to, uh, to disable such checks. And uh, that means if you have implemented one of these checks for a specific hub, uh, BGL is able to read a list of all available hubs uh, from Data Vault Builder and apply the same test case to all other hubs as well. So you build a test case just once, or even better, you download it from our gallery, and then it gets automatically applied to all your hubs. And if you add a new hub or a couple of new hubs, uh, they get automatically uh, applied to the new hubs without doing any click or something like this. So you even don't need to uh, open or access BigUL, it automatically works. And uh, so uh, here you can see how it gets applied to your data vault um, here. And at the end, you have test results and you see how the, your test coverage uh, uh, rises up and you may get email notifications or it flows something to Power Automate or something like this. So, but let me show you this in a demo. Um, so let's go over to the, here to our demo environment. And um, so uh, here you see the, the home screen of BiggieWell. Here are some uh, graphs that show you the last test results. So you see how they developed over time. And you can see here uh, in this test suite uh, that seven test cases were successful and eight failed. I just quickly show you uh, how test results look like. Um, uh, by, let me, um, yeah, sure. So here, here we go. Um, so you can dive into this uh, into more details and show you which test cases failed 
Uh, you can even analyze uh, what happened here as an example. Uh, I dive into this uh, test case that compares KPIs between an ERP and your data warehouse system. There was a slight difference, so it gets shown here and you may, may get the notification, just as an example. We have others like uh, business key comparisons here, so we may check uh, what I already mentioned, whether all customer IDs from the ERP are present within our data warehouse or data vault. We had uh, 1,300 missing keys, and that's the reason uh, why this test case failed. And you can see which keys these were by opening the details here. You can even send this as an Excel file to your, to your developers or data stewards, uh, whatever you want. Uh, but let me show you how it works, uh, basically, uh, to develop these uh, test cases. And so I prepared here a couple of test cases, and I start with a very simple one to give you the idea how BigEWell works. So uh, this business keys comparison we have seen um, is one of uh, one of the most simple test cases here. Uh, we have different uh, test algorithms out of the box that can be used, data comparisons, business rules, uh, performance testing, and so on. Uh, but for this test case, we do we compare two lists one list with the business keys from the ERP and the other list with the business keys from, uh, your, uh, from the data warehouse. And within the probes section, we define two probes. Each rep represents one of these lists. The first one comes from the ERP and it simply selects all customer IDs from the ERP. And the other one um, uh, selects uh, from the customer dimension from the data warehouse, all customer keys. That's all you need to do uh, to do this simple comparison. You could start it manually now uh, if you want, but you could also automate it with a time plan or write uh, embedded into your processes. So that's the um, a simple approach here. You can even add a third or a fourth uh, probe uh, to this uh, test case to do end-to-end -end testing. So that's really simple to do. Uh, but let us have a look how it works um, with uh, metadata from Data Vault Builder. And uh, I have here this uh, uniqueness test for hash keys. That's uh, what, uh, what I mentioned before. Uh, we are going to um, uh, access uh, a list or we read a list uh, of business keys uh, that are duplicated uh, within a hub. So uh, the result should be an empty list because we don't want duplicates and we check whether there are any of these duplicates there. Um, but uh, you may recognize here this control register. Within the control register, we can build a script. Uh, um, this one is uh, based on C-sharp, so the language is C-sharp. We integrated some um, functions and methods that makes it uh, more uh, easier to work with, uh, so it's very simple to use. Uh, so what we are doing here in line number one is uh, we access uh, our data vault builder demo database, uh, the, specifically the metadata, and from the hubs metadata table, we select our, all hubs uh, or names uh, with the, the IDs and the names. And then we loop through all these hubs. So we, we run the test case for each hub that is present within the data vault builder database. Uh, we are setting up here a couple of things, but uh, most important here is that we set up the hub table name uh, into a parameter that's named hub table. So we store this uh, for later on and we store the hub, uh, the hash key column name. Uh, we are building this here. It uh, doesn't matter how it works, but now we have two parameters that we can apply directly within our uh, SQL queries we are using within the test case. And then we run the test case. In the next iteration, it said uh, these parameters are set up for the next hub and the test case gets run and so on and so on. So um, now uh, in the probes register, you will see that our SQL query here uh, contains a couple of placeholders. Uh, so now we are accessing uh, the, the hub tables uh, directly. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, we have a hub for products, we have a hub for customers and so on. And with each uh, um, test case execution, uh, these object names get replaced. So the table names and also the hash key column names. 
And then we are grouping this count uh, and only returning the ones that are duplicated. Doesn't matter how this works here, just to give you an idea how it works here with scripting. And now if I run the test case, uh, you will see uh, that it failed um, uh, because uh, we had issues within these hubs. You can see the uh, one test case uh, run for two different hubs uh, because we have these two, two hubs within the metadata, product and customer, and we can go into details and see um, what happened here. We have some um, critical hash keys there, uh, but it uh, doesn't matter. They are uh, just shown here that way. Uh, it could be also that you add the customer IDs or whatever else uh, to these results as well. So that's how it basically works using um, metadata. There are other possibilities to do the same, uh, maybe to check whether uh, the relationships between, between satellites and hubs can be resolved correctly. So we are going to uh, select all satellites from the data world builder um, uh, database and apply the same uh, or apply a, a test case uh, to each satellite and check whether the uh, relationships between uh, our hubs uh, and uh, no uh, satellites and hubs can be resolved. So just to check whether these relationships work correctly, just as an example. And yeah, we have a lot of other possibilities with uh, with Biggiewell. And uh, the same uh, as Peter mentioned before, I could show you a lot of more features, but it would take a lot more time than we have today. And uh, I'd like to uh, go back uh, to the presentation uh, and uh, show you um, what we are offering to you today. Uh, so first of all, uh, yes, uh, please book a demo uh, with uh, Peter here uh, from Data World Builder uh, or with me from, uh, from Biggiewell, uh, if you are interested in one of our solutions. And uh, Biggiewell uh, is available uh, for one month uh, only for you as uh, participants uh, for um, a reduced price. Uh, just um, apply the, uh, the coupon code uh, if you want and if you are interested there. So, yeah, um, Peter, I, say, I would say we open the Q&A session. Uh, so if we have some questions, uh, please feel free. I would say to activate you a little bit, uh, I start your uh, short questionnaire to see if anybody of you already use data warehouse automation or test automation, that would be interesting for us. And if you have any questions, there is a Q&A button at the bottom. So you can type in your question and we can answer it here. And so there's an interesting question. Uh, it is directed to you, Thomas, but probably uh, interesting for both of us. So we have already built our own testing framework. Why should we switch if we already invested in our own solution? Yeah, that's a good question uh, we often hear. Um, from a perspe perspective of testing, it's uh, uh, there are a lot of good solutions uh, that have been built uh, by uh, um, specialists uh, within departments of different companies, and uh, uh, you they make sense for specific scenarios and uh, can be used there. Uh, but if it goes to um, extending these solutions to other scenarios or to new requirements you have, you need development resources. You need to uh, maintain or maybe change these uh, uh, these um, solutions, and uh, this needs time. Uh, also, if you are going to start a new project, uh, if you intend to build your own uh, framework, um, you are very quickly using a solution like Biggiewell. Uh, same applies to Data World Builder. Um, these products uh, have been done. Uh, we invested many, many, uh, many years of, uh, uh, of knowledge and development work, and that's simply not your core business. And uh, that's uh, it's much quicker to work with a solution uh, like uh, we offer. I can copy that, I think. This is well the maintenance cost. It's not the initial setup, uh, like loading a raw vault. If you do a specific for your case and you just want to do it one time, you will succeed in maybe two or three months and, and, and deploy that. But as soon as changes come in, as soon as you figure out that you have maybe some implicit deletes in the source systems, that you have problems with, with uh, parallelity uh, and stuff like that, you will figure out that the problem is much more complex 
that it, than you have seen in the beginning. And we have a lot of clients that come and say, we have tried to do that manually. And now we understand what the complexity is, what you try to explain us. And as Thomas was saying, we have already more a six digit number of hours invested in finding out certain edge cases, stuff like that, cover it, document it, version code, everything. So that's what we are offering you. It's like a data warehouse team or a testing team working for you, helping you solving your problems. If you have scarce resources, you need to become more efficient, reduce costs. That, that's the point. Exactly. Good. One interesting for you as well is, okay, we are using role concepts and whoa, complicated uh, security access. So let's assume yet yeah, they have different roles for different access. Can this be tested at all with such a tool like Beck? Well, because yes, how does this work? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, um, it can be tested. Uh, we have uh, security testing uh, capabilities. Uh, it works that way. Uh, you uh, you are building a list of security contexts uh, contexts you want to test, and BigWell loops through this list and uh, runs a test case for each of these security contexts. You can um, parameterize uh, your security uh, credentials that are used to access the data source. Uh, what means um, uh, you can apply test cases uh, in, the, in the context of each user or maybe technical users or whatever else uh, that you uh, want to use to do your test cases. So that means uh, if you're accessing, um, so let's say, human resources data, uh, data with a human resources user, you uh, you will get data, you will get back, back data uh, using a query. But if you are accessing the same data with, uh, let's say, an IT user, uh, you shouldn't get uh, this uh, this information back. And uh, that's what BiggieWell tests, and uh, so you can uh, do this kind of testing as well. A good one for the last, but if you automate the data vault, why should there be any errors? I mean, uh, there are two kinds of errors, as Thomas mentioned, it are technical errors. And yes, in many databases we prevent it, but it could be that somebody manually changes something on the database. It would be one problem that interferes with the automatic processes. The second thing is you want to test as well sometimes business validity. As Thomas mentioned, that you want to be sure that all of the clients from your whatever systems are then in the business rules, and you could have done any errors by processing your data, filtering, mapping it, and forgot that maybe there's no mapping values for certain category of clients, and you filter them by accident out in your business rules. This happens again, not on purpose, but yes, in big systems, there is a big potential of creating some kind of problem. And if it's the problem is not if you create a big problem. If you create a big problem, you see it in the report. The problem is if you have data errors that are maybe in one or two percent range, because you will never notice that in the aggregated figures and still they're relevant for you. Good. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? But if you uh, don't know any questions uh, yet, uh, you feel free to book a demo with us or send us an email or you find uh, contact forms on our websites as well. Uh, so we are uh, always here to answer your questions. Yep. Thank you a lot. And thank you, Thomas. It was a pleasure presenting with you. And Same. Yeah, happy again. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank you all.